And currently, Jeff is Orienteering Canada's High Performance Manager. Um, on top of all this, Jeff is also an entrepreneur. Uh, he owns Navigation Sports and provides services such as coaching and cartography as a consultant. So that's very exciting. Um, with 300 people on this call, I'm going to ask you uh, if you have a question to use the chat feature. I have a couple people here that are helping me uh, behind the scenes, so we'll do our best to get to everybody. Um, in addition, this is going to be recorded and is recording now, so we will be posting the link to the recording afterwards. So if you have to step away or you just like to refer back, which we hope you will, um, then you'll have the opportunity to do that and we'll share that out on social media as well. We'll try to get to as many uh, questions as possible. And I guess just thank you for joining us. Um, so I am going to mute myself as well. So enjoy the webinar and I'm going to pass this over to Jeff. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so I will, uh, apologies, there we go. Um, I will uh, just start off by introducing introducing my topic here, and then I'm actually gonna gonna switch tacks quickly. Um, and I've got a few questions uh, for uh, everybody on the call um, using a, a tool called uh, menti.com. So if you guys can go to menti.com on your phone, uh, we'll get a couple of questions up there just to get a sense of uh, of who we have on the call, um, so that I can uh, make sure that I'm kind of speaking at a level that everybody's going to uh, to understand at least as much as as much as possible within the realm of, uh, of what I have put together already. Um, so, so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, orienteering map reading, uh, largely from a, from a theoretical perspective. Um, got a, a couple of different models um, of orienteering map reading, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can apply those. Um, so these are, uh, these are, as I said, theoretical models, um, looking primarily from kind of a, a competitive orienteering perspective. Um, but with uh, very, very useful information for everybody from, from a beginner orienteering level uh, all the way through to kind of see what, uh, what are some of the, the ideal uh, ways to be, to be doing your map reading when you're out, out on course. Um, so pulling up, uh, pulling up Menti here, um, you, can, uh, you can use the, uh, your phone or your computer if you wish. Um, go to uh, menti.com and there's a code shown at the top of my shared screen, uh, which I hope that everybody can can see now. Um, and then I will uh, I will switch that over in a second to show the first question. All right, so here's the first question. I see some of you have already have already put that in there. Um, great to see uh, a lot of volunteers on the on the call. I know that uh, information about this uh, webinar was shared very widely on social media across a wide range of different groups. And so just want to get a sense of, of who I'm speaking to here. Um, so, okay, over, overwhelmingly orienteers. Um, so uh, so that's, that's helpful to know. Um, I know some of you are still answering questions here, but in the interest of moving this along, I'm gonna to switch to the next question. Um, and so you should be prompted there to, uh, to update your, your phone with the next question there, um, and uh, already we've got uh, we've got about 30, 30 or forty uh, answers coming in there. We've got a wide range, um, but largely kind of uh, in that intermediate and, and advanced level. Um, so that's uh, that's great. So that's a, a perfect perfect spread uh, for what we're going to be talking about uh, today. So all right, I'm going to go back to my uh, to my presentation now, um, and uh, get started by sort of giving you a little bit of an outline of uh, of what I'm going to be talking about. So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, two models that we're going to be talking about. The first um, is what I've called piloting, um, which is a, uh, a sort of a methodology, I guess that um, that Michel Georgiou, longtime coach of the French national team. Um, wrote about in his book, his excellent book, I should add, The, the Winning Eye. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about that as we go, but I do recommend reading that book um, if you haven't already. Uh, the second model is, uh, is an older model from actually a 2007 uh, article in World of O, 
um, an online uh, orienteering website. Um, and we call that Visionary Head Start. Um, it's by a, a Swiss gentleman by the name of Martin Larian. And then we'll move on to sort of putting the two together, uh, comparing them a little bit. Uh, and then I'm gonna switch tacks and show you some, some exercises that I've actually worked with RIT in Canada on, on putting together uh, largely for our, our high performance athletes uh, on our national team, but that we're making available for everybody um, for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then uh, we'll wrap up with, with some parting thoughts. Um, I would like to to mention at this point and thank Michel Georgiou for actually being on the call um, today. Uh, so if you have any uh, any questions throughout the presentation uh, for me, um, please do ask them in the chat and these will get uh, curated and, and when I have a chance I will answer at least a few of them. Uh, if we get a ton of questions coming in obviously we will have to uh, we will have to manage our time uh, on that front um, but also uh, if there's anything really specific, uh, we might ask uh, Michel Georgiou to, to say a few words at the end. Uh, so thank you, Michel, for, uh, for being willing to, to do that for everybody. Um, so first of all, the, uh, the piloting model. Uh, as I mentioned already, it's, uh, it's what uh, Michel Georgiou has outlined uh, in his book, The Winning Eye. Um, it's a little bit more of a theoretical uh, model, talking a lot about um, the physical aspects of, of map reading, which we don't talk a lot about in orienteering uh, and, and it's something we probably should talk about a little bit more. Um, the concept that um, your, your eyesight controlling where you're looking and your focus um, is actually a, a physical process uh, and, and is therefore trainable um, and something that, that can affect uh, how you orienteer. Um, so piloting I've got a quote in here from, from page 14 uh, of the book. Uh, we use the word piloting when we talk about modes of transport that change speed and direction more frequently and faster than with navigation. So making a distinction there between uh, sitting at your desk and, uh, and, and reading the map and figuring out what you would do and actually doing that while you're moving. Um, so it's a, certainly something we think about um, with uh, flight, obviously, um, but, uh, but also driving, uh, and in this case, he's saying when we're orienteering, we're seeing things moving around and we're having to make those decisions on the fly. Um, and so within that piloting, there's there's two modes um, that come together uh, for orienteering. And so that's visual piloting, looking at what you're seeing around you uh, and directional control. Um, so being able to run in a straight line, um, whether that's use of compass or, or uh, other aspects as well. Um, so visual uh, visual piloting here we have uh, a friend of mine uh, from my local orienteering club orienteering Ottawa uh, and you can see really clearly that he's looking at something not actually straight ahead of him but he's kind of looking at, at what he's aiming for uh, and so that's that highlights nicely that concept of the visual piloting you're looking for uh, the features in the terrain around you as you're going and you're going to be comparing those uh, to the map and you're going to see them as you're running by and that's really that concept of, of piloting, that you're seeing yourself move relative to the features and the features move relative to you, uh, as, you as you navigate through the terrain. Uh, so the second aspect is the directional control. Um, and at a basic level, at least, um, we're really talking here about running on a compass bearing um, without a visual target determined from the map. So it's really about, okay, I'm going in a straight line there. And you're going to be using um, distinct visual points in the terrain to help keep you on that line, but you're not uh, you're not looking for those features based on where they are on the map. You're really looking at keeping yourself going in a certain direction. Uh, so that's the basic point here. Um, so I, I would like to point out, and maybe I should have should have mentioned this earlier. Um, I am really talking at a at a very high level. I'm trying to give a very quick overview of all of this. Um, we have roughly an hour. Um, to, to get through this. Um, and unfortunately, I could, I could easily spend three times that amount of time talking about some of these concepts. Um, I, I wanna get into some of the practical aspects of it um, further on. So I'm just giving a high level overview here. Um, and again, I, I do encourage you to, uh, to actually read the book if, uh, if you really want more, more detail on that. Um, and so the, the, um, the next aspect I'm gonna talk about here is, is 
a little bit about the aspect of actual map reading here. And there's uh, there's two two main components here that are uh, that are highlighted. Uh, so the first is dynamic zoom map reading, and what we're talking about here is when you're reading uh, the detail on the map and and uh, also then the detail on the terrain, and you're comparing them back and forth, uh, right? So you're reading what you should be seeing in the terrain from the map, and then you're looking in the terrain and you're saying yes, that matches, um, and here's where I am, and you're flipping back and forth uh, between between the two. So there's a couple of physical concepts that come into play uh, with this this zoom map reading. Uh, so the first um, is visual acuity, and that is your sharpness of vision. How can how easily and quickly can you read um, small detail, essentially? So oftentimes this visual acuity uh, is a concept that you might be familiar with uh, when you go to an eye doctor. They give you um, they give you that Snell and eye chart. Um, that uh, has has the letters in different sizes there and how far down the chart can you read, right? Well, a very similar concept applies with orienteering where we've got oftentimes a lot of black rock detail or maybe some, some various shades of green in, in small pieces. Um, and how much of that small detail can you actually pick up? And that is something that uh, decreases naturally uh, over time. You need to, you need to get glasses, um, but it is, an un perhaps unfortunate reality in orienteering uh, that this is something that we have to have to deal with. Um, and so the second aspect of it uh, is the uh, optical accommodation. And so that's the mechanism by which the eyes change from distant vision to near vision or vice versa. And so when we're looking in the terrain, we're looking far into the distance, you're using uh, your, your far vision, your distance vision, and then you switch quickly down to glance at your map and you need to adjust your focus um, and, and adjust the lens in your eye uh, to get that map into focus and you're switching back and forth. And so how quickly can you do that? And just like any other uh, muscular process, um, you can train that response uh, to improve your response time uh, there. And so this is something that you, can, you actually improve through training. And so we can create some specific trainings to, to work on that. And it will, uh, you will see an improvement in that in your reflected in your, your orienteering. Um, again, not something we talk about, but perhaps something we should talk a little about a little bit more. And so talked about the zoom map reading. The other main aspect here is um, what is termed tactical mental route. Um, so I'm just gonna read from the screen here quickly. A tactical mental route is a mental image of a planned route to a control point, including features, changes of direction, and changes of speed. Creating a TMR requires concentrated visual attention, which directs the way the map reading is done and involves all the knowledge accumulated by the orienteer over years of training and competition. Um, so what we're talking about here is not the, reading the detail on the map, but seeing the bigger picture now. And so if I'm trying to get from point A to point B, I want to pick up the big hills, um, the trails, the streams, the big cliffs, um, so that I can choose uh, how I'm going to get from A to B. And then I'm going to build on that in terms of how I'm actually going to, um, to get through um, using the zoom map reading, the directional control, what different elements of my navigation am I going to actually use to, uh, to do that. So, oops, excuse me. There we go. Um, so actually, um, one more thing I'm going to say here. Um, we talk about tactical mental route. I'm just going to briefly mention what the different elements of that are. So tactical, um, the reason that the tactical is in there, we're finding a tactical solution from getting to A to B, right? It's a, it's a problem that we need to find a solution for. So that's the tactical. The mental aspect is because this route isn't flagged in the terrain. It exists in the mind of the orienteer, right? So you're, you're reading the map, you're coming up with your solution, and then you're, you're kind of keeping that in memory as you're actually navigating from A to B. And then finally, route, uh, because you are choosing a route uh, made up of a chain of features, and, uh, and, and techniques as well. So then uh, there's three elements uh, to this tactical mental route. Uh, the first one is route choice. So what 
uh, what route are you going to take? I might go straight, uh, there might be a big lake in the way, I'm gonna go left around it or I'm gonna go right around it. Um, and then building on that, we're gonna choose which route we take. We're gonna look at planning. What piloting modes and what features are, are you going to use along that route to make sure that you are um, on track as you're going uh, and that you can actually get through uh, efficiently through the terrain. Uh, and then finally, map memory. Once you have that plan, you need to remember, perhaps not all of it, but at least the next steps um, so that you can execute that efficiently. Right. And this is something that comes with a lot of practice and with a lot of experience. And so for those of you that are on the call that maybe don't have that level of experience, this is something that we're working towards. This is not something uh, that is going to come to you overnight. It's going to be something that comes with a lot of practice um, and just a lot of looking at maps. Um, so don't expect to, uh, you know, OK, I've done this presentation. I can I can go out in the woods tomorrow and I'm going to be an expert at this. Absolutely not. Um, the map memory, the planning, the route choices, all takes experience to to do that well. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to jump to an example now, and I'm going to give you a minute to to look at this. So with this uh, with this leg here, this is from a, an event that was held in Ottawa in the summer, um, uh, this past summer, I should say. We have a route leg six to seven, and I want you to take a minute. I'm going to zoom in zoom in a little bit on it here. And you can take a minute and look at what route uh, you might take and think about uh, then the planning. What are the different features that you would use to get from six to seven? All right, so I'm going to pull up three different route choices in blue and red and yellow there. And I'm not making a judgment call on, on which is best. Uh, the answer to that is very individual uh, based on your own strengths and weaknesses uh, and a ver variety of other factors. Um, but for the sake of the, the next step here, we're going to look at the red route. And I want, to, want you to think about what are the elements of uh, the route uh, that you are going to do. Where, where are you going to use that piloting? Where are you going to use the directional control? Uh, where are you going to, what are the features that you're going to look for along the way? All right. I'm going to pull this up again, but with a different layout here. And so this is a different representation of the route. This is talk, looking a little bit now at the planning component of it. Uh, the different features that you're going to look for. And so I'm looking here, K6, uh, out of control six, I'm taking my directional control, my compass bearing, I'm going to cross a trail. Um, but the real important thing is I'm looking for that big straight trail um, that's, uh, that's this one here, right? It should be fairly obvious when I get to that. And then I'm going to jump on the trail, look for this crossing point along the way. It's going to tell me I'm about halfway to where I want to be, which is the corner here. And then compass bearing again, I'm going to look for the features in this circle. I'm going to look for this re-entrant here. I'll take that re-entrant across the big gully. And then cross up the other side and take a compass bearing in uh, to the control where I'm going to look for my control feature. So that's the basic concept there is that we have our route, but then we need to actually look at the different um, elements of that along the way for the actual execution of that route. Um, so the final piece uh, that I want to talk about here um, with the, the piloting concept is uh, a very fascinating uh, concept that uh, Georges talks about, which is the concept uh, that orienteers have, well, all runners have a maximal aerobic speed, which is extremely simplified. How fast can you run? Um, but there is another factor which is perhaps more important for orienteering, which is the maximum map reading speed, which is how fast can you run while map reading. Um, so if you have um, an experienced runner but a novice orienteer, they're going to have a really high maximal aerobic speed, but they're going to have a low maximum map reading speed. 
You might, on the other hand, have a slower, um, a slower orienteer, but they're an experienced orienteer that has a lower maximal aerobic speed, but their maximum lap reading speed is relatively high compared to that maximum aerobic speed, right? But ultimately, what makes the difference is what that maximum map reading speed is. Um, where, you're, where you're reading the map on the run and able to pick up everything on the map and also keep going, moving through the terrain at the same time. Um, and again, uh, for those novice orienteers, this is something that co comes with years and years and years of practice. Um, all orienteers start out uh, kind of in a, a start and stop fashion where they might run a little bit and then they're gonna read the map and then they're gonna run a bit. Um, that's a little bit of a different concept. Um, but nonetheless, as we, as we progress, you're kind of working towards that reading the map on the run and that's where this maximum map reading speed comes in. Um, and so I'm not gonna get into them, but there's a number of tests uh, and a number of uh, simulation exercises that can improve your map reading speed and also measure where it's at. Um, and uh, Michel Georgiou goes through uh, really thoroughly what those, what those tests and what those exercises are. Um, and uh, we'll look at a little bit some of those um, if we have some time at the end. Um, but now I'm going to switch over to uh, talking about map reading model number two, the visionary head start. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, this is a model uh, kind of described by Martin Larian and uh, posted back in 2007 on, uh, on World of O. And it's something that I've gone back to numerous times. It's, a, it's an excellent model that really has, has stood the test of time. It takes a bit of a different approach. Um, and, uh, and in this model, he details five types of map contact or map reading. Um, and uh, those types are, are visionary, detailing, affirmative, retrospective, and reading the next step. So I'm gonna talk in the next uh, 15 minutes or so about uh, what those different um, map contacts are. And throughout, I've used these colors um, so that you can know which type of map reading I'm talking about throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, so first of all, a few terms. So we're gonna talk about beacons, uh, which are specific technically significant features uh, that kind of divide a leg into segments and provide points of navigation and, and confirmation. So they're, they're very large, obvious, spe uh, specific things that you're gonna be looking for along the way. So when we showed that previous example, those circled features, those would be the beacons that we're looking for. Uh, and then map contact is another term that we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about. Um, and that is an individual map reading event in quotes here, where the runner looks at the map and gets information from it. So each glance at the map is one map contact. Okay, so there's, well, four or five properties of each map contact. So the first one, uh, where, or you could you could call it what on the map do you want to read? Do you want to uh, do you know where you're wanting to read, or do you not really know where you're wanting to read? Um, so this property has a lot. Whoops, excuse me. This property has a lot to do with the uh, with how long your map contact takes, which is the question that I've got at the bottom on the slide here. Um, the next one: Where are you focusing compared to your current position? Uh, so you can be focusing uh, at something you've already passed. You're trying to read something that, oh, I saw that uh, 50 meters back or 100 meters back. Um, you could be looking at the area that you're currently in right now, or you could be looking ahead of you at something that you can't yet see in the terrain. Okay. Um, and then the third one, where are you focusing compared to your current vision? And uh, so, so the important thing here is do you have any beacons in front of you? Are you reading in the area that you already have a vision from that visionary map reading, which I'll get into in a bit? Um, or are you reading further ahead and building up uh, your picture of the terrain because you're reading in, in terrain that you, you don't have in your mind yet or you, and you don't see in the terrain yet either? Um, so then the end result here is, what is the result of the map contact? Um, and this is, this is really the, the key one here because we have one result per map reading type. This is how they end up getting divided up. So you have a new beacon, so you have extended your vision, okay? You have a new beacon providing you more detail to your existing vision. Third option here, you have an idea of what is coming next. 
Fourth, you have an explanation for what you did. And fifth, you now know where you are. Okay. Um, and then each of these ends up with uh, sort of a, a fifth resulting property here, which is how long is your map contact? Okay. So that each different type kind of takes a little bit of a different amount of time looking at the map to, uh, to get the information out of it. So again, I'm going to highlight these visionary. This is where you're looking at the map for a longer period of time. You're trying to build up a, a picture of the terrain. Detailing, similar concept, building up a little bit more detail. Affirmative is a short map, map glance where you're picking up some detail that you see in the terrain. Retrospective, you're uh, reading uh, what you've already passed. You're trying to figure out, okay, what was it that I was passing? What was it that I was seeing in the terrain? And then reading the next step is where you're just reading the next feature right ahead of you. Okay. We're going to go into those in detail. So first of all, the retrospective map reading. Um, so this, this image that I've got on the screen here is a screen capture from, uh, that world of O, um, article. So full disclosure on that, that is not my, my graphic. And you can see here uh, in this image, you're running along and you've passed through this green area, but the green area is what you are reading. So you're building up that, that picture of the terrain. You have an explanation for what you did. Okay, that's what you're trying to get out of this. The key here is thinking about what is the result of this map contact? Um, and then how do, I, how do I therefore use that? Um, so you're gonna use this type of uh, map contact when you're trying to relocate. So when you've gotten lost, you don't know where you are, you're trying to match up what you've run through, figure out where, where you're going to now. So that's the situation where you're gonna to want to use that um, in the terrain. This next one is the, um, the reading the next step map reading, I've called it. Um, and you're really just looking at what is the next thing. And so you'll see here on this image where the, the map is, it's come along, looked at the map in a bunch of spots here, and this green area that he's looking at is really quite small. Um, you're looking at just what is the very next thing ahead of you. So that's not very efficient, um, but certainly if you're a new, uh, a newer orienteer, it's kind of the natural first first place to start. Um, so you start there as an experienced orienteer. You really don't want to fall into the trap of having to use this because it isn't as efficient. So you have an idea of what is coming next, but really not very far ahead. Okay. So the next step is the, the real key to this visionary head start model, which is the visionary map reading. And so what we have in this image this time, we've added a new color. We've added this green color, or sorry, this orange, uh, this orange shape. And the orange in this case uh, is, is representing the visionary region, as, as it's called here, which is what I already have read and looked at and the green is what I'm looking at now with this map contact. So I already have in my mind's eye the picture of the terrain uh, in this orange section. And I'm extending that past my last, uh, my furthest ahead beacon to add on to that, that visionary image. Okay, so the results of this map contact is you have a new beacon, so you have extended your vision. And then we're going to get a little bit more detailed here with what is appropriately called the detailing map reading. And so you'll see again the orange and the green on the map here on the right. And we're looking at a smaller green segment within the orange segment that I've already got in my mind's eye. So I've looked at the terrain and I've got a fairly good image, but I don't have all of the detail because I'm not, I can't cram every single detail uh, into memory but I'm coming up to, I want to see a little bit more of what's next. I want to see, add a little bit of information into that mental picture of the terrain. And so that's where this detailing map reading uh, comes in. So now I have a new beacon um, midway between the other two beacons that provides a little bit more detail um, to my image of the terrain, okay? And then uh, the final, of the five map reading or map contact types is this affirmative reading. And in this case, you're reading a really small little section. You see, you've just got this tiny little green circle here. And if you look on the left, we've got this big wide orange triangle and we've just got this slim little green section within the orange. 
So the way we use this is if I'm passing some, something in the terrain, I've got that mental image of the terrain, that mental map in memory. And I'm running through the terrain and I see something that I wasn't expecting. So, okay, I see a cliff on the side of the hill here. I know where I am on my map. I'm going to look at my map and I'm going to go, oh yes, that cliff is there. Or I'm going to go, oh, it's not, in which case I need to figure out how I'm going to react. Um, but the idea is that it's a quick glance at the map. It's just confirming something uh, that I see in the, in the terrain. Uh, and so the result of this map contact is that you now know exactly where you are. So that can lend you a little bit of extra confidence, right? So I added on as a, as a fifth element at the start, the length of map contact. Um, and this is important because when you're, when you're planning your, your map reading, um, you want to know what you're trying to get out of it. And you're wanting to figure out, okay, uh, I'm going to glance at my map with purpose, right? You don't want to be in this situation uh, like we all so often are. If we, we glance at our watch, we glance at our phone to get the time. You look away and you go, wait, what time was it? I didn't actually get any information out of looking at my clock, right? And so you look at the clock again. So um, in very similar fashion, a, a lot of times it becomes very easy to just glance at the map, not know what you're trying to find, what type of map reading you're trying to do. You glance at it, you look away and you go, well, that was useless, right? And then you have to look again. Um, and so going through those five, the retrospective map reading takes the longest. And it's important to note here that my time in seconds is just approximate. It's not based on any kind of study or data. Um, and that the time any of these map glances uh, takes will decrease with practice and experience. So you'll get faster at it. But the one that is the slowest is the retrospective. You're really studying the map to try to match it up with what, you've, uh, what you remember passing through in the terrain, right? Where you're looking, whoops, where you're looking uh, backwards into what you just went through. The reading the next step is um, a really quick map, map glance, but you're reading ahead, but you're only reading one step ahead. So it's shorter, but you're gonna have to do more of it. And then we get into the three that in an ideal world, as an experienced orienteer, you would be trying to cycle through. So the longest of those is the visionary. You're trying to get a big, big scale picture of the terrain uh, in your head. And then we go down and, and roughly cut in half here uh, is the detailing map reading. Uh, it's a similar concept, but you're looking at a little bit of a smaller area. Uh, so you're, you're kind of zoned in and a little bit more focused on what you're reading. And then the affirmative, where you're just checking something off. It can be a really, really quick map glance, less than a second uh, if, you're, if you're experienced uh, and those with younger eyes as well. Um, and that's just kind of giving you that confidence and checking out that yes, I know exactly where I am within that, uh, that visionary and detailing picture that I've got in my mind. So I'm going to talk about now uh, some map reading cycles. I've got kind of hinted at it. Um, the first one and what a lot of, or of orienteers start with, and that's totally natural, is retrospective, retrospective, retrospective. I'm running along through the terrain. I go, shoot, what, was, what did I just pass? What just happened? And then I run along a little bit more and I go, okay, yep, yep, okay, now I figured out where I am. Run along a little bit more, figure out where I am, and so on and so forth. Um, when you're just starting out, that's totally natural, but we want to progress beyond that. So the next progression oftentimes is that reading the next step. Okay, so I know where I am, and instead of figuring out how I got to where I am and where I am, I now have the confidence to know where I am, and I'm reading ahead. So I'm going to read the next step. Okay. I'm coming up to that trail junction next. Okay, I get to the trail junction. Okay, I'm coming up to the lake next. Okay, I'm coming up to the big cliff next. Okay, my control is just beyond there, right? And you're again in that kind of a cycle over and over and over again. Um, it's a good progression from that retrospective cycle. But where we're wanting to be is in this kind of a cycle here that you see on the screen now. Visionary, taking a longer look at the map, figuring out where you're going. And then as you're running, um, you're going to, while you're running, look at the map when you have a chance for maybe four seconds instead of the 10 seconds, and you're going to fill in some detail um, in your mental image of, of the terrain. So I've got two big hills. I'm going through the saddle. I'm going to come down the other side uh, and, and enter into a big broad valley there. 
And in my detailing picture, I'm going to add in that, okay, I've got a, a cliff on, on the right side. There's a stream coming down uh, into the valley uh, and I'm filling in a little bit of that detail so that um, as I come up to that terrain, I have a bit of a better picture of, of what it looks like. And then as I'm going along, uh, I'm gonna check things off with the affirmative map reading. So that's, that's kind of the, the end goal that we're looking for. Um, the missing piece in all of this is that, what is that tactical mental route? What is that route choice? What is my plan? This tells me what kind of map reading I'm going to be doing to be uh, visualizing the terrain, but it doesn't really get that tactical and that route choice piece uh, in there. Um, so we'll look at this here and you look at that and you go, okay, great. I can know my cycle of map reading, but it doesn't really help me in this case because I really need to decide how I'm going to get from A to B. And there's a lot of uh, varied route choice here uh, with some major features um, blocking the way, right? Um, so I've picked out four different route choices here. Uh, there's almost infinite variations on this as you go through the terrain. Um, but for our next example, we're actually going to look at um, look at one of these route choices. Uh, and so I picked one essentially at random. I picked this red route here. And if we zoom in a little bit, I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of things. So um, this is how I would, would be doing this and what I would be looking for here using, uh, using the tactical mental route concept, um, taking essentially uh, that directional control, that compass bearing uh, out of the control here on this, this yellow arrow, uh, looking for the end of the lake and this kind of broad re-entrant shape here in the contours. Then I've got a, a green hilltop, a marsh and onward with another hilltop and so on uh, as they go. Those are kinds of the big features uh, that I see and that I'm going to be looking for and that I want to be picking up in my in my map reading, right? So putting this in, in terms of the visionary head start concept, again using those same colors, um, as I'm uh, as I'm actually as I'm approaching my control here perhaps, so what this blue dot is just outside of the control circle is where I'm gonna be looking at this uh, blue highlighted area. So that's my visionary map reading. And it's gonna take me about 10 seconds as I'm entering the control so that I can leave that control smoothly, right? This is, again, this is kind of the, the end goal here of all of this. Um, and I'm not expecting anybody to necessarily be able to do this. If you have to stop at the control to figure it out, uh, great, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, I'm looking for that large area, getting a bit of a picture in my mind of it. And then almost right away, I might look again at getting some of that detailing map reading and getting a bigger picture of a smaller area, right? A more detailed picture. Okay. And then as I leave the control, I'm passing a boulder um, just, just inside the circle still. And I've got that circled uh, in yellow. I'm checking that off with my affirmative map reading. It gives me confidence I'm leaving the control in the right direction and then I'm on track. Okay, next thing I see is that cliff. Okay, I'm gonna glance at that again. Again, making sure, double checking that I'm heading off in the right direction. Okay, path. continuing along, I see the cliff and the boulder there. Uh, right off to my right, I kind of look over my right shoulder. I see that there and I'm gonna check again uh, that, that that's there. And then I'm reaching the end of my detailing section. And I'm going to add a little bit more detail to that bigger visionary picture of the terrain that I have in mind. So I'm looking at uh, adding that marsh, a couple of those hilltops I see, um, and then noting the fact that it's green, which maybe I already had, had noted, but I'm adding a little bit of detail there. Okay. And I'm going to simplify things a little bit here. I might see uh, in this case, um, just to pick one example, that, oh, I see a, a rock in the terrain. And I glance, I know, I know where I am because I've just passed the marsh and I look at my map and I go, oh, that boulder's not there. Okay, worry starts to set in. Why, is, why am I not confirming that that rock is there? I look at it again and oh, it's because it's a smaller rock that maybe the mapper didn't put on just because of its size. So continuing along my route here, um, I'm starting to approach the end of my visionary section. I'm going to add in this new blue circle um, further to the right, uh, extending uh, my vision uh, of the terrain. 
continuing along, adding a little bit more detail, and then adding more uh, uh, more to my vision. And so there would probably be more um, more affirmative map reading thrown in there um, that I left out just to simplify a little bit. There's a lot of detail on the map that you might check off. Um, but uh, just to, to really focus on what that cycle is of those three types of map reading and how they how they work together. Right. So then if we put them in a totally different format, um, we can look at the cycle. I had them in circles before, but it continues on. Um, so I've broken it up in a little bit of a different way. So we're starting with that visionary map reading, detailing, affirmative, 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 adding a little bit more detail, checking off another feature, and so on. That's the cycle that we want. If somewhere along the way, I don't do that visionary map reading, I end up breaking out of that cycle, and I'm running along, and I don't have that vision, so I'm kind of heading off into, into some trouble, right? And so I'm going to be stuck here with um, needing to confirm where I am, right? And so, so we're going with the, um, oh my goodness, I'm just blanking out on what the name of that map reading uh, style is. Give me a second here. The retrospective uh, map reading. Right, so then we use that map, that retrospective map reading, to uh, to figure out where we are again. And then, because I'm wanting to continue on with my running, and I don't have that vision, I now fall into that um, that reading the next step map reading, and then I end up stuck in that circle. Right. So I break the cycle that I want. I have to figure out where I am. That's the relocation. And then I fall into a classic trap of with that, uh, that cycle of reading the next step. Um, so now um, we're going to, uh, we're going to put the two models together here. So I'm going to give a, a quick comparison of, uh, of the two here. So the pilot, um, it's theoretical in some senses. It doesn't give you a practical example of what to do in the woods. It's uh, something we can, we can definitely work on. So in that sense, it's practical. Um, but when you're actually out orienteering, um, you really want to be thinking about that visionary head start, right? Um, the piloting is, is largely based on physiology. There's a lot of uh, thought in um, into it based on the actual physical process of, of eyesight and map reading and so on. Um, whereas the visionary head start is really based on the map reading outcomes and the navigation strategies. It really doesn't explain the physical process of, of the map reading. Um, the piloting discusses the route choices and the, the, uh, the planning process, which the visionary head start really doesn't. Um, the piloting doesn't talk about those different types of map reading. Um, at least not in as much detail. It does talk a little bit about the zoom map reading, where you're reading that detail and looking at the terrain and the tactical mental route. Um, and it accounts for compass, whereas the visionary head start really, really doesn't. Um, so they both kind of give us different things and they actually play, um, play into each other's hands really well when you put the two of them together. And so looking at this route choice again, uh, and the tactical mental route, we're going to go back to that red route, and you can see all the way along where I've highlighted um, the parts of the plan for that route choice uh, that one might uh, one might have. I've circled the features that we're looking for, um, and drawn in in arrows where I'm either following an obvious feature or using uh, using that directional control, that compass bearing. Um, and so you can kind of see how the two fit together, where we have, we previously had just gone through the uh, um, the visionary head start concept of the different types of map reading. So if we put those together using these map reading cycles again, we're going to shift this off and we're going to add a step to it. And this is where the tactical mental route piece comes in. You're going to choose a route. You're going to come up with a plan, right, where we've highlighted the features, where we're going to use the compass. Um, you're going to have that plan and then you're going to execute that 
with those different types of map reading, right? As you as you go along. So this is kind of this is kind of the end goal um, for uh, for experienced orienteers um, or orienteers that are aiming to be experienced orienteers, and for our uh, our high performance athletes and our national team members competing uh, internationally at uh, at events. Um, so I'm going to take a quick break there um, before we get into some examples of our piloting exercises and uh, give our moderators an opportunity to um, to pass along any questions uh, if there are any at this point. I'm just going to take uh, maybe five minutes or so to answer just a couple questions if we have any uh, that have come up. All right, I know none, none have been passed on to me yet. Um, so at that point, um, we might as well move on. And do, if you do come up with any questions, um, do ask them in the chat. Um, and, uh, and we can spend a few minutes answering some of those questions. Um, so I put a link here uh, for some piloting exercises and I'm gonna jump out of my presentation and uh, and go to that link and we'll look a little bit about some of those exercises uh, that are detailed in the winning eye and these are exercises as i mentioned right at the beginning um, are exercises that i put together for our high performance program uh, members uh, that are aiming to compete for canada at world champs and we have made them available um, for the general public uh, if they want to give them a try during the uh, the COVID pandemic. So this is where the link takes you. Uh, it gives a brief overview of, uh, of the concept of, of making these available. And there's three links at the bottom. So the first one is a bit of a read me. We're going to skip that and we'll jump into what the exercises are. And the third link uh, provides some common answer sheets that you're going to need to, uh, to actually complete these exercises. So I keep getting uh, my Zoom bar popping up here. So here, uh, here's a folder. It's, it's stored in Google Drive. And it's got a, one folder for each of the exercises that we're making available. So I'm going to start um, with, let's go with the, uh, which is a good one to start with, the control quadrants is a good example. The point of these exercises is that uh, they work on that maximum map reading speed because you're going to pair a map reading activity with a um, with a running workout. And so, uh, in this case, in the explanation, I've suggested. Um, well, I've explained I've explained the exercise first of all, and then I've given a sample workout uh, that you can do. In this case fairly vague, but ideally this exercise should be done with interval length such that you are pushing the pace you can physically run while zoom map reading. Uh, in other words, you should be able to run the interval nearly as fast as you can run it without map reading and still be able to complete the exercise without having to take more than a couple of glances at each control. Naturally, this is going to vary um, from person to person based on their speed, based on their, uh, their orienteering experience. But if we go back to our Google Drive here, I'm going to pull up the map. Okay, and so in this case, um, that is showing up fuzzier than I was prepared for. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. Is this going to work? No. So I'm just going to download this and pull it up. Um, in my PDF viewer. Just so that everybody can see what I'm talking about clearly here. Okay, my 
apologies for this. Okay, apologies for that. Here we have the map uh, pulled up. And in this case, I've used a, a map I'm familiar with um, from my home club here. And you'll see there's a course marked on it, but you're not actually gonna be running this course. You might run this exercise around a track, um, or in this case, doing laps around your backyard, if that's all you can do. Um, and the question that you have to answer um, while you're running your intervals and you're, you're doing the map reading, because you're gonna have the map with you in your hand, is where relative to the actual center of the circle, where the control is, is the feature shown in the control descriptions. So in the first one, I'm looking for a clearing. And the center of my circle, my control circle here, if, we're, if we zoom in closer so we can see it, is centered on that middle knoll. And the little clearing is to the northwest. But what we're looking for here is relative to the line I'm coming in. So if I've got this oriented um, the way I would be would be running uh, running the orienteering course, it's going to be in the bottom right quadrant, right? So if we kind of draw um, draw a line through this, um, yeah, if we draw a line through this like like so and so, we kind of have four quadrants and it's in that bottom right one um, relative to that. We then look at our next one on our next interval and we're looking for the re-entrant. And if we're going from one to two, the re-entrant that we see in the circle here is past it and on the left from of this line, right? So that's our center line. This is our other line here. It's in the sort of the upper left corner. And so with each exercise, I provide an appropriate answer sheet. Um, and for some, I have it uh, posted there. And for others, I've got it posted separately because it's a, a common answer sheet that, my apologies, um, that might get reused. And so here I have it in this four quadrant answer sheet and you're going to circle A, B, C, or D for each control based on your answer. So the first one we said was bottom right, so that's D. And you can mark that with a pen, you can circle it, you can use a pin punch um, if you want to use one of the, the old orienteering pin punches. Uh, the second one we said was top left. And so you're going to be running your intervals, you're getting a physical workout, reading the map at the same time, that's that maximum map reading speed. And then you're going to answer it uh, between intervals, take the appropriate rest, and, and start again. And so it's a good way of combining those different things. And um, and I've put together for Orienteering Canada about eight or so, so far, and we're gonna be adding one each week. Um, the Winning Eye puts together 40 or so uh, different types of exercises um, that can be done uh, that I'm, I'm working from when I'm setting all of this up. So I wanted to highlight that. That's just one example. There's lots in there if you want to if you want to read through it. Um, and uh, and so those are there and available for all to use. You can use this link here um, to to access that information. So all of this will be posted to um, to YouTube. Um, we're, we're recording this whole presentation. So any of these links, if you want to come back to it, uh, you'll be able to do so um, via YouTube and we'll post that uh, on our social media and, and so on um, as soon as we have that prepared. So that might take a couple of days to get that prepared and then we'll be posting that for everyone to see. So any of those links that I've talked about, uh, any of the, the resources on this page here, um, 
you don't have to go and quickly scramble to write that down. Um, you'll be able to access that after the fact. Um, but I've highlighted largely the, um, the material that I've been referencing throughout. So, uh, so that Visionary Head Start article, uh, another article linked to it also on World of O, um, where Thierry Georgiou talks about his, his map route planning approach um, that has made him perhaps the most successful male orienteer of all time. Uh, of course, the winning eye be met by Michel Georgiou. Uh, for those of you in Canada, uh, ostore.ca, that's o-store.ca, has copies in both English and French. Um, and it is available at orienteering stores around the world as well um, for our international participants here. Um, and then just generally, World of O, um, great website for a variety of international orienteering news. Uh, and also posts um, some great exercises of different kinds and lots of maps that you can use um, to do some, some map study, uh, look at those, think about how you would apply the visionary head start concept and or uh, the, the piloting concept in the winning eye um, to those. And finally, Orienteering Canada um, has, has social media uh, and their website linked there as well. Um, which has uh, has lots of great information and shares lots of things on uh, on social media that you might find uh, interesting and or helpful. Um, so with that, um, as I wrap up, I'd like to thank Orienteering Canada for uh, for starting this speaker series um, and for inviting me to be the uh, the first speaker. Uh, it was an honor to speak to uh, so many of you today. Um, and with that. I'm going to uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. We've been an hour on the on the line now, um, but we can probably take about 15 minutes or so. Um, if anybody has any uh, any questions they uh, they have, Jeff, it's about Tracy. Anything that I've been talking about. Did you see the question from Katie? I have not. Okay, so the question from Katie is: Do these strategies change significantly for events like ski orienteering? where there is much more on-trail navigation compared to off-trail? The same basic principles would apply, Katie. Um, the way in which they would, they would be applied would perhaps be a little bit different. Uh, the mechanics of reading the map in ski orienteering uh, in particular is different because you don't have the map um, in your hand, right? It's either, it's either strapped to, to your arm or to your chest, um, and so the actual physical process of map reading is a little bit different. Um, my apologies, just a second. Um, but also the, uh, because it is on the trails, you're moving at a little bit of a different speed perhaps, um, but the type of detailing that you're gonna be looking at is, is different, right? It's much more of a take the left turn, take the right turn um, and trying to, trying to keep those straight. Um, but in general, the same basic concepts apply. You're going to look at the map and try to figure out what your route is. You're going to take a big bit of a bigger picture, and then you're going to maybe look in and zoom in on the detail of some of those junctions uh, as you're going along. Um, so in broad strokes, it applies, but yes, it applies maybe a little bit differently um, for ski orienteering as, as my example there, but also um, mountain bike orienteering or, or a couple of other variations as well that you might encounter. Jeff, I haven't seen any other questions come through. I'm just scrolling through the chat. Great. Well, I'll um, give it uh, give it another couple minutes if anybody comes up with anything. But otherwise, um, thank you for listening in. Um, and uh, I'm glad I was able to share this, this information with everybody and um, have, a, have a good rest of your day.
Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and obviously on behalf of Orienteering Canada, thank you everyone for, for joining us. This was the first in our series. So we're looking to have one, uh, another uh, webinar in the next couple weeks. Um, so probably mid-May, different topic, but we hope you can join us. So please watch our social media for um, more invites coming. And thank you for persevering for those of you that had trouble logging on. And um, if there's no other questions, we will probably log off in two minutes. We'll just keep the chat open. Thank you very much, Jeff. So it looks like there's another question uh, from Katie, uh, Katie Dunn here. Uh, if you are working on not doing the one step ahead version, is it better to stop moving completely and try to read ahead rather than staying behind? Um, so I would say it, it depends on depends on the situation. It depends a little bit on what your intent is here. Are you trying to have the uh, best possible result you can, or are you trying to use this as a, as a training opportunity? Um, you're going to, as you, as you kind of switch, over, you're, you're not going to always have success with it right away. It's going to come and go as you as you gain more consistency. Um, but yes, oftentimes I would say it, it is better, especially if you're sometimes getting this concept of, of reading ahead and starting to get that pro that flow uh, through the different types of map reading. Um, you uh, you might want to stop and try to get into that flow again. Um, if you, if that's kind of new to you and you're just starting to get into that, um, then again, it, it depends on what um, what the situation is in the in the terrain. Um, so you're gonna try a little one or the other depending on what uh, what you see. That's kind of the best answer I can give at, at this point, unfortunately. Um, another question here, what is the biggest time save that elite runners have um, versus intermediate runners? Um, hard to pinpoint one biggest time save, um, but perhaps it's, it's the ability to um, move with confidence on their image of the terrain, knowing what are the features that they'll be able to see which just comes with practice and especially practice in different terrain types. Um, but is that being able to, to uh, use that visionary map reading and that detailing map reading to have that image in the terrain so they don't have to stop and refer back to the, uh, the actual physical map. They have it in their mind and they can uh, just refer to that rather than having to stop, read the map every time. Um, so do we still have a few people on the line here? We do. So I'll answer a couple more questions. Um, got one here from uh, Maria Jacobs. What about doing it with someone else? How do you coordinate the next route quickly without stopping? Um, depends on the scenario. If you're working with somebody um, that you've navigated with before and you kind of trust each other, you, you might um, take turns doing that navigation if you know that, that they're fairly strong on that and you, you'll just trust them to it. Um, otherwise, yeah, you, you're going to have to have a conversation, uh, have a conversation about it. But ideally, um, you would have that trust and you would maybe be doing that, that double checking of the, of each other with the affirmative map reading, um, checking things off and kind of following along as you go, um, to kind of catch each other's mistakes. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you're either going to need to let somebody pick the route or you're going to have to have a discussion about it and choose. Uh, what kind of a strategy you're going to take to uh, to get from A to B. Um, so Leighton Ray asks, I'm the step-by-step -step orienteer. How do I break out of the cycle and get into the visionary detailing and affirmative route? Um, Leighton, you're just going to have to, uh, you're just going to have to try it and it's not going to work right away. Um, but but the one thing I would suggest is practice looking at the map and then putting the map down 
and trying to picture what you've seen on the map. Um, it takes a lot of work, particularly uh, on the contour side of things to get that 3D picture of the terrain. Um, but go for it, try it, make mistakes. Um, and you can, you can do a little bit about that, um, that practice of the, the map memorization sitting at a desk as well. Uh, Joan, is there a recommendation on which sim uh, simulation exercises to do first, or does that depend on your skill level? Um, it might depend a little bit on your weakness as well. You can look through them. Um, some of them are a little bit easier than others. I've tried to adjust the, uh, the running exercise component um, to go with that. So if it's a really hard one, you might even just do it sitting at your desk. Um, but other than that, um, these are designed first and foremost for our national team athletes um, and then being made available to everyone. So do keep that in mind uh, if you're looking at doing some of those exercises. All right, so I think we're gonna wrap it up there um, and that'll be it for today. And hopefully you can join in uh, some of Orienteering Canada's future um, sessions as well. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tracy.